this is my new to me small sabenza classic now the small sabenza classic is the predecessor to the current small sabenza 21 and in this video i'll be not only talking through the significance of the classic model but giving a broader reflection on the importance of the sabenza not just for the knife industry but really as a gear item that can be considered a kind of archetype for what I consider to be truly excellent gear. This is not going to be a review so much as a reflection but considering some of the historical significance of the classic small Sabenza and then talking a little bit more broadly about how the characteristics of this knife really have greater weight than this particular item in itself but really give some perspective about what we really should care about in our gear. So since this isn't really going to be a proper review, I'm not going to necessarily go through all the specs in detail, although they will be listed in the annotations below. This is basically the very standard issue small Sabenza. This one in particular, as you can see, features the plain titanium scales and a upgraded dual silver thumb stud. Now, as you can see here, this is the classic model. Now, the classic model Sabenza was introduced in 2000, hence the Roman numerals, and remained in production for eight years, uh, after which it was replaced by the Sabenza 21. Now, the classic Sabenza has kind of an important place in Chris Reeves' history being that it was in the year 2000 that Chris Reeve really started amping up his production and uh, according to their own biography of the Sabenza as it were on their website the company really reached an important turning point basically that was the first year where Chris Reeves exhibited their products as a full-fledged manufacturer this allowed them to enter products in different categories where they would compete with other manufacturers. Most importantly, the manufacturer's quality award at Blade. And so for 2000, they won that award and uh, they continued to uh, be acknowledged by the industry for their high standards of manufacturing quality to this day. And so getting a Sabenza from the year 2000 for me is kind of special because this is the knife, arguably, that really put Chris Reeves on the top tier. Or at least if they were on the top tier before, this was the year that they were really acknowledged as doing something truly exceptional. The knife kind of speaks for itself, at least amongst most knife aficionados. I don't really need to go through the general appeal of the Sabenza, but the classic does have some things that perhaps at this point have been forgotten or maybe not remembered as keenly in general by the knife community, although I'm sure Sabenza enthusiasts remember them. Now, the uh, big appeal of the classic Sabenza is the unique double bevels that go around the entirety of the titanium scales and notice how precisely those double bevels are carried through except in spots where they'll resolve to a single bevel. Just amazing slight details that carry their way through the entirety of the knife. I actually think they're the most interesting, the most beautiful in the cutaway for the thumb stud you can see how there's kind of a spectrum of angles that is very simple yet very beautiful if you open up the knife you can see how all of those multi bevels resolve in both the integrated lock and in the scale.
the history of this specific example of the classic Sebenza is noteworthy just insofar that it might relate to some router points that I'm going to be making. So this particular example is from 2000, and it originally came with a, a BG42 blade, but in 2004, it was replaced by an S30V blade. I'll just show you real quick the knife's blade before it was replaced by an S30V blade. Obviously, I'm kidding. <laughs> I just found this picture online. It's ridiculous. Uh, S30V, of course, being a steel that Chris Reeve himself developed in collaboration with Crucible Industries. And so it's kind of neat that it was upgraded to this very nice, uh, still very highly regarded steel that Chris Reeve really specifically gets credit for. Now, uh, it also has that silver thumb stud and silver hardware, which to me just gives the knife a wonderfully clean and resolved look. It all ties together so nicely. Here's the Chris Reeve guarantee, and by no means is it necessarily the singular best guarantee in the entire industry. A number of knife companies have great guarantees, but the wording and the philosophical underpinnings of this guarantee are things that I kind of want to reflect on and uh, discuss a little bit. This knife is guaranteed for life, and it's going to be a trustworthy companion, a helper, a defender. If you look after it, it will look after you. So the Chris Reeve guarantee is basically saying that there aren't going to be major defects, or if they are, the manufacturer is going to take care of them. And uh, similarly, the design is meant to serve the end user indefinitely. Now, the conversation about perfection with knives is perhaps you know, beaten to death, overdone, risky, all those things. And so I don't want to embark on the typical conversation about, oh, the, the Sebenza is the perfect knife. What I want to talk about is the etymology of perfection, which is thoroughly made or well made. And if you look at every component of this knife, every part, as well as all the mechanical functions of the knife, it is perfect in that narrow etymological sense. The finishing is flawless. The design is really suitable for the kind of end that the creator had. And every part is designed to last indefinitely. Now, you could find things that are imperfect about this in the maybe the, the lanyard that rattles a little bit or the unnecessary machining hole. But that's really niggling, arguably, and... With regard to the knife on the whole, there really isn't a lot of criticism that can be seriously leveled against the integrity of the design. That is to say, in the design as it's carried through in the finished product thanks to an excellent manufacturing process. And that is not just with regard to the fact that this is a very pretty and well-finished knife, but mechanically, this is a knife that is so suitable for its purpose. The lock which is such a beautiful simplification of the liner lock, 15 years after it was manufactured, is still rock solid. I mean, we're talking no play at all. Yes, it's a little lighter than some people prefer, but frankly, uh, it's perfectly reasonable. I mean, 60% on a 15-year-old frame lock is not a big deal at all. And uh, ergonomics are great. I mean, this is an easy knife to disassemble and reassemble. This is a well-made knife, not just with regard to its finishing, but with regard to its mechanical execution as well. Heck, you don't even need to lubricate these knives the same way that you need to often lubricate other kinds of knives. The blade just falls freely the way it comes from the factory. So considering the utter simplicity of 17 parts with this knife and how well it all comes together nearly flawlessly, I, I can't help but be reminded of some principles about why I review gear and why I think this is maybe a, an opportune time to kind of think a little bit more broadly about what constitutes worthwhile gear to have, worthwhile things to have. And uh, the reference text that I'm kind of thinking of is Shop Classes Soulcraft by Matt Crawford. Um, it's a great book just kind of inquiring into 
a number of uh, issues of uh, material value and the value of work. And one of the things that he talks about is what he calls thinking is doing. And so he quotes an exegorist who says that it's by having hands that man is the most intelligent of animals. Uh, you know, Heidegger says something similarly when he says the nearest kind of association is not just perceptual cognition, but handling, um, taking care of things, which has its own kind of knowledge. And so what he talks about is how we as a society kind of have two tensions in our self-interest. On the one hand, he describes what he calls, you know, time is money, the opportunist cost attitude, basically saying, I want to get uh, the most that I can get for the least amount of effort, for the least amount of personal investment. A good example of the kind of thing I'm talking about is actually the phone that I'm filming this with, as opposed to, say, this knife, which has 17 parts uh, which are readily intelligible and understandable. This phone has hundreds of parts and uh, hundreds of, of processes, both electronic and physical, that I have almost no comprehension of. And so the economic benefit of this phone requires, to some extent, me giving up an understanding or an appreciation of the inner workings of this phone. Now, in contrast with this attitude, Crawford talks about what he calls a spirited person or the person who's the master of their own stuff, acting in a way that we actually are possessors of these things and therefore mastery of these things, not just in kind of a, a functionalistic way, but actually with regard to the maintenance and uh, inner workings of these things, there's a certain kind of, of virtue there. Another way of putting it is talking about how in a consumerist and material culture there's what could be described as an ideology of freedom that by disemburdening ourselves with the knowledge of the things that we're using, we're free to be less responsible for them. Now, that is not necessarily a good thing. In fact, I feel like it points to a defect in our uh, agency as a culture that that. Uh, mastery of things, mastery of the tools that we have, which this more than anything is really a beautiful tool, is a kind of excellence. And stewardship of this kind of thing, the kind that uh, I think Chris Reeve wants us to feel responsible for, as indicated in his warranty, requires a different attitude, a different really uh, perspective, a different uh, morality, a different ethic of stewardship than what we frankly see in a lot of mainstream material culture. And that certainly is true of many gear items as well. And a good knife is something that I think most people would benefit by appreciating uh, what makes a good knife. And that's somewhat up to the manufacturer to produce it in a way that renders it intelligible. Now, I'm not saying that uh, a mechanically complex knife is a bad thing. I'm just saying that we run the risk of just becoming uh, more materialistic than we need to be if we have no concern whatsoever for the inner workings of a knife. Certainly in the long term, stewardship is not going to be possible unless we can maintain these knives ourselves. Uh, eventually makers are going to die or companies are going to go under. Not necessarily this company, but... Uh, the, the prospects of having to maintain a knife more than just sharpening um, is something that I think most end users should recognize they would benefit by having a mastery of the things that they're possessing. So it's a kind of virtue that maybe doesn't universally need to be a necessity for every gear item that we have, but it's one that I, you can certainly appreciate in its own right. So an example just by way of contrast is this Spyderco Manix 2 Lightweight. This is the most recent version with an excellent Super Steel S110V. Now, this knife utilizes state-of-the-art steels and really state-of-the-art polymers, too. This is an incredibly lightweight knife for the size. But at a sacrifice of the end user's mastery, do you only arrive at these things? Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. I love this knife. I think that the cutting performance is exceptional and the carryability of the knife is fantastic. But... Is this going to be a knife that I think is going to hold up as well over 15 years 
of use the way that the Sabenza is? No. Is it going to be able to be remanufactured in the way that the Sabenza is? No. You'll just have to replace these scales, which they're designed to be disposable. They're pinned. If these scales get messed up, you're going to put new ones on. You're going to send them to Spyderco. Similarly, servicing this knife is uh, somewhat limited. Fortunately, this one has good centering and good action because if there is any need for me to take this knife apart, it would be difficult for me to do. Similarly, adjusting the lock is also somewhat limited because of the pin construction. Spyderco had a different philosophy in terms of long-term use with this knife than Chris Reeve had with the Sabenza. Again, I, what I'm trying to say is not... To create, I'm not trying to create a universal rule that limits the kinds of knives or gear that I'm saying are good gear, but I'm just trying to point out that there are certain virtues in this kind of manufacturing process and this kind of end result that you give up if you're trying to do other things like, like you are in this knife. It's sometimes good to have high-tech and futuristic, but there's an importance, maybe something fundamental about appreciating bedrocks. So to draw this all together, the Sabenza is really a paradigmatic model of a knife representing, I think, some excellences of tools, of gear items that we could really strive to appreciate. And this particular example, the classic Sabenza, really shows the details and the beauty of the end result of having a process that really intends knives or any gear items to be a durable good. Durable good being something that could last indefinitely. And this knife, with proper care, really is the kind of thing that I could imagine owning for a lifetime. If you found this video interesting or thought-provoking, I'd really appreciate your thumbs up. Make sure you let me know what you thought of it in the comments below, and feel free to check out these other videos. If you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing. And thanks a lot for your time.